Okay. Th thanks very much, Tom. Appreciate uh, that introduction and kind of leads well into what I want to discuss today, and that's a bit how we are in Ohio working with this whole issue as far as nutrient concerns and water quality. I want to start off, uh, just share a bit the discussion points I uh, want to share with you today. Um, first, I, I think it is good to review a little bit uh, where we stand here in Ohio in relation to Lake Erie and uh, describe a bit more what Tom indicated as far as the 2011 year versus the 2012 year. There's certainly some lessons there that give us a idea of what we need to apply and be looking for towards the future. Uh, th then I want to talk more specifically about some of our nutrient approaches that we're taking uh, in an application of the 4-Hour Nutrient Stewardship type of ideal, in addition to some other nutrient management plan um, opportunities uh, that exist through the EQUIP program and RCS, uh, kind of those uh, specific things that we're working towards as far as nutrient management plans. And then I think there are some other best management practices, uh, treatments uh, at edge of field that we might be thinking about in what we're going to do, and we'll kind of review those really quickly here this afternoon. I, Tom kind of gave you an indication here as far as uh, the watersheds here in Ohio, and we have our, our two major watersheds going in, to the north uh, with Lake Erie, and you can see the southern two-thirds of the state uh, does break and go south towards the Ohio River. And we're going to be really focusing in as far as this northern area of, lake, of uh, Ohio as it relates to Lake Erie uh, for a few minutes here. Um, this image here uh, really was what caused a tremendous focus and uh, what in 2011 caused a lot of concern related to what was happening on Lake Erie. Um, we've had some other problems on some smaller lakes. Uh, we've also had some increasing problems in the western basin of Lake Erie. But uh, what you see in this uh, fall image of Lake Erie is actually um, algae growth as you see it along the central basin. And uh, this kind of growth of algae was not anything uh, we've seen uh, since the 1970s. Uh, and I think if you, any of you are aware of the history of the Great Lakes, and particularly Lake Erie, the 1970s were not a very good time as far as water quality on Lake Erie. Um, we, we've had this type of green growth uh, of algae uh, throughout the past several years in the western basin, but having it, ex having it extend out into the um, central basin was the great concern. And, and really, as you talk about uh, this, uh, not only do we have the concerns from an algae standpoint uh, related to just the algae presence and its interruption in activities on the lake, but uh, these algaes that grow late summer are called harmful algal blooms where they do actually produce a toxin that uh, through water treatment has to be uh, of a concern and then also as uh, people would use it for recreational purposes be of a concern. Uh, within just Ohio, talking about the economic impact of Lake Erie, uh, there is a, about a two, two and a half, excuse me, a ten, ten and a half billion dollar economic activity related to recreational uses on the lake uh, for the coastal area. So it is a big economic driver that we need to be thinking about. And our, we, we've been looking at phosphorus uh, as we had seen the problems in the western uh, basin area for a few years. Uh, actually, our Ohio EPA had put together a task force looking at uh, uh, phosphorus issues in the lake. Uh, they have tried to summarize our uh, loading problems uh, with the um, with phosphorus coming into the lake and portion it out towards the different uh, uh, regions uh, feeding into the lake system. Uh, the connecting channel right here, you can see the connecting channel is uh, uh, coming from the north, uh, from uh, really uh, the northern lakes area into Lake Erie. Uh, the western basin is what we've been talking about as far as uh, mainly contributing from the Maumee River as well as the Sandusky River. And then the central eastern, eastern basin would be some of our other watersheds going in further to the east into Lake Erie. Uh, the number that I just want to point out here is they do attribute uh, via um, calculation to non-point and point source contributions of phosphorus into the lake. And you can see that 
that big number there is our non-point source going in. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, there is about 4.3 million acres that um, most of it being in Ohio, a little bit in Indiana, a little bit in Michigan that feeds into that western basin area. And uh, this is certainly one thing that we're looking at uh, and really looking at how the, we from a agricultural standpoint can reduce that contribution coming into Lake Erie. Um, we, we've talked about, and, and Lake Erie, as we mentioned earlier, has had some historic problems with water quality. And actually, there is uh, uh, international uh, discussions that occurred back uh, in the 1960s, 70s, related to improving water quality. And they came up with a, a discussion or a target goal of 11,000 metric tons of, as far as total phosphorus loading going into Lake Erie. Um, you can see uh, in the 1960s uh, through the early 80s that uh, we saw a declining level of contribution of total phosphorus going in and actually have been meeting that targeted goal of total phosphorus for uh, several years in a row here. Um, and uh, not too many years do we exceed that. Uh, so the, the question becomes, what is the problem? Why are we seeing this increasing a uh, problem related to phosphorus in Lake Erie. And uh, this chart helps to start to explain that. Uh, while we've seen total phosphorus loads go down, we've actually seen dissolved reactive phosphorus concentrations in the water uh, rising. Uh, they had fallen from the early 70s through the mid-90s. And then you see a increasing concentration as we go uh, through to the uh, you know, 2011 and recent period. Uh, you can see that, uh, and really, a lot of people would say that uh, the, wealth, the lake was its healthiest uh, as we look at this uh, period in the mid-90s. So really, we'd like to see that concentration at that point zero four somewhere in that area would be where we'd like to get back to. And um, you can see from some of the recent numbers that we're going to have to reduce that by half as far as uh, trying to reach that goal of a healthy lake. Um, what we saw here in 2012, uh, you'll see a different satellite photo here, uh, same, as you note, uh, same date as what we had uh, in 2011. But uh, you just see a little bit of uh, concentration there as far as sediment coming into Lake Erie. Um, you don't see the green growth that happened uh, in 2011. So the algae production was really much less and, and really as far as lake health and being on the lake, uh, a, a much better year. I think everybody would like to have uh, 2012 and 2013, although we don't want a drought to try and get that to happen. Um, when we talk about uh, contributions uh, and why, as far as an explanation, Mother Nature kind of provided us an experiment this past year related to um, that whole discussion about what contribution phosphorus makes to that algae growth. Um, really, if you look at the water year, which is in October through September period of time, 2011 and 2012 were very similar as far as the amount of discharge, the amount of total phosphorus, and the amount of dissolved phosphorus going into uh, Lake Erie. What you see is a tremendous difference in the March-May period as far as loading going into the lake. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is total phosphorus coming in from the Maumee River and really a 95% reduction in that period related to uh, phosphorus going into Lake Erie. Um, look at it from a dissolved reactive phosphorus, uh, very much a similar type of number. And uh, this period, as far as about four to six months in advance, as far as total phosphorus, um, gives us an indication as far as what kind of phosphorus levels we have in the lake support uh, uh, phosphorus growth later in the year. Um, when we talk about dissolved phosphorus, it seems like a loading about four to six weeks prior to uh, that bloom is what we see as far as a correlation. And so uh, when we're talking about uh, this 2012 to 2011 year, um, certainly we saw a reduction in phosphorus and a reduction in algae growth. And so uh, it gives us an indication that uh, really we, we do have the answer and that we need to reduce phosphorus. Um, certainly the challenge is getting that phosphorus reduction to occur uh, without a drought. 
Um, so we were trying to get back and, and want to in 2013 and moving forward see this type of image, and that's what we're uh, really starting to work with. Um, when the 2011 period came up, uh, actually we had a tremendous discussion related to uh, agriculture reduction as far as uh, nutrients, and uh, the agencies here in the state got together as far as a public process, uh, grew, grew from a large number of resources to try and identify those practices which could help us as far as reducing uh, nutrients coming from an agricultural standpoint. Uh, this has also been done from an industrial and uh, sewage treatment level standpoint as well, so uh, looking at all sources coming into the lake. Uh, really, the one thing that kind of keyed on and, and made sense was uh, really a focus from an agricultural standpoint on the 4R nutrient stewardship programming. Uh, Tom's done a good job of describing that, so I won't uh, spend much time with that, but uh, then we also think about it from the standpoint of other management practices to keep nutrients on the field and available for crop production. And uh, just a brief discussion about tile because we do rely very heavily on tile and how that might affect what we're seeing from a nutrient addition standpoint. Our uh, right rate, uh, certainly Ohio State University, like most land-grant colleges, do provide recommendations uh, here in our region. Actually, we work with the state of Michigan and Indiana and have a tri-state publication that relates to our soil test recommendations and the correlations that have happened back to soil test. Uh, we do have a website here that has all of that information, and we've added a number of fact sheets recently to help us uh, in getting information out to our growers and our egg retail industry here in the state of Ohio. Um, the other thing that we're really focusing in on is having uh, people do uh, take advantage of all the nutrients that they apply. If they're applying manure, uh, certainly count that as part of the contribution to nutrients and uh, make that as a uh, plant available form that we can uh, count on as far as crop production. Uh, we actually have a person focused in on uh, trying to um, look at in-season uses as far as top dressing uh, wheat and side dressing corn of manure applications, uh, really trying to take advantage of that nitrogen component and uh, one more level of economics that we can add to that whole nutrient decision from a manure standpoint. Uh, at the right time, uh, certainly one thing that we are focused in on is nutrient applications in winter months. Uh, uh, no applications to frozen snow-covered ground. Um, also, obviously, nutrients applied as close to uh, use of the crop as possible can uh, help us as far as reducing uh, losses at the edge of the field. Um, also, uh, if we're not um, making that application close to when the crop is growing, we certainly want to use forms of the nutrient that allow us to uh, limit off-site movement as well, so getting into that uh, selection as far as what type of product that we're going to apply. Uh, placement, uh, really looking at uh, some kind of injection. Uh, we've seen some numbers here in some of our runoff studies that uh, injection or incorporation can reduce by 60% the amount of loss uh, of uh, nutrient at the edge of the field, so really looking at that as a, another key focus to our discussion. Uh, then looking at other placement options. Uh, row starters uh, certainly have kind of disappeared as we've looked at larger equipment, so um, a opportunity there to maybe uh, look at equipment and how we can uh, uh, go about in a different fashion that uh, row starter application, um, which might be a strip tillage type of application. Uh, we do go across the field at other times with fertilizer application equipment, so we might look at alternative timings related to um, actually applying nutrient, and then obviously, as we discussed, uh, incorporation are some uh, things that we're looking at from a placement standpoint. Uh, we have with Ohio State uh, and cooperation with our NRCS uh, folks here in Ohio who have an equipped precision nutrient management plan option available to our growers, which uh, really focuses in on geo-reference nutrient applications and in addition to that, looking at controlled traffic, uh, been working with uh, some of our uh, re retailers here in the state of Ohio, looking at uh, uh, nutrient management plan developments to help support that uh, uh, NRCS uh, equip program. 
uh, that what we're using here as far as NRCS is concerned for that plan development is the MMP map windows GIS tools that are available through Purdue and you see the website there and we've been providing support to our uh, CCAs and folks here in the state of Ohio to get that accomplished. Um, kind of covers the, the 4R applications and some of the things that we're doing in a broad stroke related to uh, trying to apply them to our situation here in Ohio. Um, in addition to that, I think we've really honed in on uh, looking at soil quality and really what we're trying to accomplish through that is uh, a, obtaining more matrix flow of water through the soil versus preferential flow and increase our infiltration rates and uh, trying to reduce runoff potential for uh, the lands that we have to try and reduce that phosphorus ending up in our uh, river systems. Um, in addition, uh, one thing that is a big focus is talking about tiling. Um, certainly here in Northwest Ohio, we do have a large percentage of our egg, egg ground that will benefit by improved drainage. Uh, you can see that um, we focus in on this uh, red blotch, which is, as you remember, to the original map up front, uh, a big part of that western Lake Erie Basin area. And uh, we do see uh, drainage being a very important aspect because with those uh, glaciated soils, uh, we uh, do have some heavy clays uh, and getting drainage and getting um, ground in condition so that we can get across. And uh, we do see tremendous yield benefits. Uh, you know, 25 to 30 bushels on corn uh, is not uncommon. Um, 8 to 10 bushels on soybeans would be another uh, drainage benefit that we would see very readily. Um, but with that tile, we obviously do uh, develop a conduit uh, that will help support some loss of soluble phosphorus. Uh, we do have a researcher that with USDA ARS uh, here in the state uh, that has been working with this, and um, this is actually a watershed uh, that is north of Columbus where they are looking at uh, contributions from tile for a soluble total phosphorus standpoint. And you can see that on average over a six-year period, half of the soluble phosphorus was being lost through the tile line, as well as half of the total phosphorus being lost through the tile line. So with our heavy use of tiling, that has certainly come under scrutiny by a lot of folks, um, and how that is contributing to uh, this whole uh, situation that we see as far as nutrient enrichment of water. Um, the other thing that we have a lot of in the state is uh, blind inlet, or excuse me, of these uh, stand pipes uh, that are out in fields that basically serve as surface conduits of water. Um, what we really need to move towards is some of the blind inlet type of uh, situations where we can uh, still get rid of the water but uh, have it filter through the soil and that um, in some Indiana research is reduced by 40, 60 percent, that level of dissolved nutrient coming off. Um, another practice that we're looking at is water table management as far as an edge of field treatment, uh, using these uh, control structures uh, to hold back water at certain times of year. Uh, we can certainly see a reduction in loss of soluble nutrients through the use of this practice. Another thing that uh, we're doing some research on is related to this whole ideal of using uh, biofilters at the edge of field certainly has been successful related to uh, nitrogen management in some areas or shows potential for uh, nitrogen uh, management. Uh, also, we see where we can use some uh, different um, materials and actually precipitate out phosphorus as another option. And then uh, another practice uh, that we're uh, working with uh, some uh, adaptation of is two sage ditches where we take a look at the ditch and, and uh, change that channelized uh, ditch into a more natural uh, situation with some grass benches where we can have some filtering occurring. So uh, another option that we're thinking about and, and using here in the state. I, I guess uh, in summary, uh, the big thing I want you to know is that we're, we're looking at phosphorus, but it's not the total component that we have in the past. Uh, total P is not our big concern. Right now, we're really focused in on this DRP. Um, soluble nutrients uh, require new practices compared to some of our practices that would have been trying to limit total phosphorus, which we were successful in limiting through the use of uh, conservation tillage and practices that keep soil on the ground. 
And uh, then from an agricultural standpoint, uh, looking at BMPs, uh, the 4Rs, uh, other practices to try and keep nutrients on the field, as well as even looking at the extent of treating water before it's released from the field is where we're at from here, us here in the state of Ohio. So with that, uh, I want to introduce John Oster. Uh, John is